I'm really excited for our conversation today. I have an expert, a scholar joining us to talk about the gospel. And he has several books that he has written that really kind of break down what is the gospel. And we're going to be talking about Matt Bates' new book today, uh, Why the Gospel. And some of you uh, probably have already read some of his other books before. We're going to go through this a little bit more here in just a moment. Uh, but I'm really excited because the gospel is something that is very murky for a lot of people right now. What does Jesus actually say in scripture. And what is the story? I think that's part of what you're seeing in society right now is there's these competing stories about who Jesus is and who is he. And so Matt's, Matt's going to get into that today. A little bit about Matt. Matthew W. Bates is the father of seven and professor of theology at Quincy University. His popular books include the award-winning Salvation by Allegiance Alone by Baker Academic, the Birth of the Trinity, Oxford University Press, and The Gospel Precisely by Renew, and The Gospel Allegiance by Brazos. When he isn't hiking, running, baseballing, or chasing around the seven, he co-hosts the On Script podcast. I actually look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Bates holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics, wow, and an MCS in Biblical Studies from Regent College, and a PhD in Theology of New Testament from the University of Notre Dame. A Protestant by conviction, he enjoys the privilege and challenge of teaching in a Catholic context. Love it. Learn more about his books, and I'll put in the description a little bit more in terms of his website, www.matthewwbates.com. Matt Bates, welcome to the channel, my brother. Kyle, hey. I'm, I'm so grateful to get to be with you and uh, super excited about the life-giving message of King Jesus. Mm. So let's, let's talk it through. Let's do this. So uh, briefly, we got to start with people who they maybe have never heard of you or they haven't read your previous books. Let's start up with the Gospel Allegiance and the Gospel Precisely. Tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so I've been working on the topic of the gospel for quite some time. Um, it's something of a scholarly passion. Um, and this emerged partly through my own life experiences as, uh, you know, growing up, I grew up in a predominantly fundamentalist slash evangelical kind of Baptist context. Mm. Um, it was typically, it was, it was actually technically independent, but uh, nevertheless, it was kind of Baptistic. Uh, in its orientation. And, you know, as part of that, the gospel message was featured often. Um, but as time went on, and as I, as my studies, you know, continued, I began to realize there might be some problems in the way in which um, the gospel was being framed, both mm -hmm. in the context I'd grown up in, but also in the church at large. So um, that drove me to um, begin to work more deeply on the gospel. And I, I can tell you even more about the background. We could, we could dive into further details if you wish. Mm. Um, but um, any, anyway, that, that, that culminated in a number of projects. Uh, the first was called Salvation by Allegiance Alone. And that's the book that um, is a little more on the academic end and, and really got the ball started in terms of this conversation. Um, and you can probably catch by the allegiance alone that I'm trying to have a conversation about the, what the word faith actually means. Mm. Um, eventually, then, um, I was given an opportunity to write a second book um, with, with that same publisher uh, within a different imprint that was a popularization on the one hand, but also going deeper on select areas. And that's the book Gospel Allegiance. And so really, that book is themed around like trying to develop a core model for how to understand salvation. Um, and so really, it deals with like the really key terms and what they actually mean from a New Testament vantage point. The really key ideas would be what is the gospel? What is grace? What is faith? What are works? How do they all fit together? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's something that's plagued our, I think, our theology is trying to navigate the, the, all of those. And, and how you define one has implications for the other. So gospel allegiance really focused around that. And then um, on the basis of that work, I got an invitation from Renew, uh, which is a church networking group, um, mm -hmm. kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of some other church networking groups, kind of like the Gospel Coalition, but this one has mm -hmm. a quite different flavor. Um, Renew um, and it would be also associated with discipleship.org. Mm -hmm. um, this church networking group tries to resource, especially around uh, King Jesus ideas and around discipleship ideas. So it was a natural fit for my work. Um, and they asked me to write something that was really, really something that you could give to anybody. 
you know, that's um, you, you could really give it probably to an advanced junior high student on up. Uh, and that's the gospel precisely. It's more like a booklet than a, than a book, very short chapters, a couple thousand words per chapter, five chapters is really uh, just gets right to the heart of the matter without dumbing it down, but keeping it as simple as possible. Yeah. When it comes to the gospel, I'm so glad that we're having just a, a, a conversation about the gospel because depending on your fellowship stream, depending on, or if you want to call it denomination, the gospel emphasize, is emphasized in different ways and emphasizes different things. So mm -hmm. in the heritage that I come from, baptism is a big piece in the way that baptism works um, as it relates to um, you know salvation and so forth. And it's just, I, I love that we're having this conversation because when, it, when you strip it all down, I think, I think at some point it is simple. And I think that what I like that you're going to do and share with us a little bit more is how to make it simple in the right way. We don't want to simplify the wrong thing. Um, we don't want to make things shallow. We want to we want to keep depth, but we want to get to the root. And I think that that's what I'm really excited about. The next question uh, is really uh, beginning with this book. Again, if in this book, when did this book come out? Why the gospel? When? This book is hot off the press. This book came out. <laughs> yeah, this book came out on Tuesday. Today is Thursday. Uh, so okay. this book came out on May 16th. This is, uh, we're recording, you know, uh, May 18th, 2023. Gotcha. So we're talking about two days old uh, as far as this book. Wow. Um, so you begin the book with, and by the way, the, the introduction is really good by Scott McKnight. I'm, I, I'm a fan of his. I'm actually going to be Me having too. him on in the fall with his new book, Pivot. Really excited about that. Um, but you start with the concept of Jesus as king. Why do you believe that is the place where we need to start? Well, I could answer that question from a whole variety of perspectives. <laughs> um, one, one, on the one hand, I could answer it from a scriptural standpoint, the other from a personal standpoint, and maybe those are both to but both important to cover. Um, but I think probably we want to put scripture in the driver's seat here and say, uh, because that's what scripture emphasizes, um, that scripture, uh, as scripture itself is trying to summarize the gospel, it does so repeatedly again and again through the simple claim that Jesus is the Christ. And because Christ means a Jewish-style king who would have universal significance, um, it, it implies automatically a King Jesus gospel. So, um, you know, for example, in Acts of 542, right, it talks about the early church's characteristic practices. And what were they doing? Well, part of what they were doing was continually teaching and gospeling the Christ is Jesus. They were gospeling the Christ is Jesus, hmm. right? And so uh, this claim, right, then is that uh, Jesus Christ— um, uh, that term uh, means something more than a name, right? It means that Jesus is, in fact, the king. So we have to start with Scripture. Um, on the other hand, I could flip that and say, uh, out of my own personal life experience, sometimes um, I have not been wise. Uh, there mm -hmm. have been times where I have not allowed Jesus to be king, and I think I've learned a personal lesson there that I'm a pretty terrible king of my own life. Uh, mm. That when I have tried to take the reins and I have to try, if I tried to decide, you know, I'm just going to navigate things my way. I'm going to decide what's right and wrong for myself. I'm going to try to set my own goals. I'm going to have my own purpose. Uh, whenever I've done that, and uh, even when I've tried to convince myself, I'm kind of doing this for Jesus, but really I'm doing it for me. Um, mm. The result <laughs> has usually been some, some pretty serious rot, uh, some pretty serious rot in my own life. So I think I want to answer that from both perspectives, saying on the one hand, Scripture makes it clear that this is a King Jesus gospel uh, because the term Messiah or Christ is a certain kind of king. And on the other hand, right, um, yeah, we personally need this king. How do we balance one of the things that uh, Scott McKnight talks about, and I actually talk about it a lot, is this idea of a both and. Um, that in some ways there is this idea for folks where they kind of go extreme in the kingship direction and then other people go extreme, let's say in the savior direction, right? That this is, and you, you really do a good job of talking about the individualism that we think of. Like when we think of the gospel, we think about it very individualistically, which I think is part of the problem or maybe the issue. But those two extremes of king and savior seem to be pitted against one another. Uh, how do you reconcile that? How do you be, bring both into the same world? 
Yeah, well, I think that we need to recognize that we only experience salvation through Jesus's kingship. Hmm. And so I think we've gotten the cart before the horse, because I think that um, maybe the way in which we've tried to package salvation um, and is this a, is this any surprise? Uh, the way we try to package salvation is in a very self-centered way. Mm. <laughs> or, shock, shock of all shocks, right? That we would be self-centered. Um, wow, that's a that's a, that's a huge surprise. <laughs> um, but I think it's true that we have thought about um, what is it that I need. <laughs> that's been the premier question. And as we inspect the situation, and we've heard a lot of preaching, uh, it, it's the suggestion is that okay, you have sinned. Uh, you have this guilt, this this debt on your account that you can't possibly repay. Mm -hmm. And so you have a personal lack. And what you need is somebody to provide for that. You need somebody to cover the balance. You need somebody to, in some way, provide forgiveness of your sins. And then you are OK with God. You're reconciled with God. You get to go to heaven. Uh, lots of different ways about, of talking about that. But notice what's happened there. It's a me-centered gospel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's all about what do I get out of it? The truer perspective from Scripture is that we that the gospel is about a new king and that the king delivers these benefits to all those who are part of his people. And that what we really need to do is acknowledge his kingship so we can become part of his people, which is a slightly different way of thinking about it and framing it. But it brings those together. Right. The king provides benefits would be another way of speaking about mm. it. Those benefits include forgiveness. But what we want is we want forgiveness without the kingship, right? Wow. We, we don't want to go through the kingship. We just want the we want him to be our savior, but not necessarily our king. But the way in which he is saving us from our sins is through his kingship. And we have to become more aware of that. So there's this idea that it's you have kingdom and you have empire. When we become a Christian, we we swear our allegiance to Christ. And what I'm learning is in some ways the process of, and you're going to get, we're going to get to it in a little bit about transformation or, or discipleship is the process where, okay, we, we swear allegiance to Christ, but the process of turning our back on empire. I think at times I have made this assumption that because someone swears their allegiance to Christ, that that means that they have turned their back on empire. And I actually have to push back on that because when I think about the pandemic, when I think about racial tension, when I think about politics, it, it all of those things have exposed the different layers and different levels that empire exists within churches. And, and if somebody listening to this right now, you're triggered or you think that, that empire doesn't exist within churches. And so empire can be very murky. And so can you share a little bit about this idea of turning your back on empire and in this idea of allegiance to Christ in, in our context. And the reason why I say this is because when I think of Lord, um, when I think of ruler in some ways, in our westernized context, there are, I want to say, ancient longstanding wounds around kingship, mm -hmm. a monarchy, a kingship. Mm -hmm. You know, that that that's something that we push back against. <laughs> but that's something that you write about. Can you share just a little bit about that? Yeah, and so I, I like how um, you said that when we become Christians, we swear our allegiance to King Jesus. Um, I'm glad that you framed it that way, and uh, I hope that all of our listeners are framing it that way in their minds already. But I wonder if the church is really at that place yet. right? And that's a, that's a key concern that I have in writing this book, is that I think there are a lot of people who would not necessarily be on board with that as a pri primary understanding. And we gosh, we got to get them there first. Um, mm. But once we get them there, Right. Um, you're right. It doesn't mean that um, we have therefore automatically learned what it means to uh, follow King Jesus and in so doing to um, to slough off right portions of inappropriate um, empires that um, maybe mm. have have a, a, prem a premacy on our allegiance. We're trying to give allegiance to King Jesus, but we do have to recognize that it's a learning process. We, we can go no further than the very first moments when somebody first declared allegiance to King Jesus to, to, to discover the degree to which it's going to have to be a learning process for all of us. And that's with, uh, with Peter, right? Whenever uh, at that key moment in the Gospels at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, you know, um, you know who are people saying that I am? Hmm. Uh, and uh, we, we have that brilliant moment, right? Uh, where, um, you know, the, the disciples offer a couple answers, you know, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, you know, well, Jesus sort of like pivots on them. 
and 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 kind of points the finger in their face and says, but you, what about you? You know, who are you going to say that I am, right? The ultimate question, uh, the, mm-hmm. the ultimate question that, that should haunt every Christian, like what, uh, and, and the world, what are mm-hmm. we going to do with this Jesus guy? And Peter nails it, right? He's like, you are the Christ. Um, and we have that a, a, a little, that's Mark and Luke. In Matthew, it, it says that Peter said something more. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and Oof. so we have this uh, moment where Peter identifies him correctly, right? And uh, that we think, okay, now he's going to be on board with this King Jesus idea. But what does he immediately do? Jesus starts saying, yeah, the, let me tell you, I'm going to have to suffer. Um, you know, and, and, and Peter, of course, is like, no, no, Lord. Like, you, you know, you're never going to have to do this. And then Jesus has to rebuke Peter. Um, so we see, like, even in that immediate moment, right, that it's not as if somehow or another getting it right, that correctly identifying King Jesus means that we've managed to squeeze the world out, right? That's mm. going to be a long process of learning to gaze upon Jesus in order to begin to squeeze out those other empires. So let me ask you just kind of a, before we go to the next question, because you're a scholar and I, I have questions. <laughs> I, <laughs> I truly have questions. Uh when I think of swearing my allegiance to Christ, um, I remember kind of like initially before I, I, I feel like I truly swore my allegiance to Christ. Initially, it was more of an altar call where I, you know, the sinner's prayer, praying Jesus in our heart. I did that 50 million times. And then there was this other moment where I actually had a group of folks who studied the scriptures with me and really helped me to really walk through lordship and what that would mean for my life. It wasn't a perfect process, but it was a process that allowed me to swear my allegiance to Christ and 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 as a swear an, an allegiance allegiance event, so to speak, I was baptized. And so uh I know you weren't necessarily planning to answer this question, but where does baptism fit in the in the the swearing of our allegiance to Christ from your from your research? Yeah. Um, I want to just circle around that toward that question, but just resonating with it from my own story, I have a very similar experience kind of growing up, you know, my, some of my first memories are accepting Jesus into my heart, right? Uh, my mom was teaching me scripture, but we didn't go to church and it took a while for me to, um, to get it. Um, and it wasn't until I was in junior high that I was baptized and I began to get it. But again, it was mostly like an altar call kind of experience. And mm-hmm. my church did a great job of talking about Jesus as Savior first. But then they're like, Andy's your Lord, too. Right. Um, and it was hard to figure out what was meant by that, because it seemed like all the heavy lifting of salvation had been done through accepting him as my savior. And that this Lord business was like a tack on. And there was a, an urgency about it. No, it's an, an it's a necessary tack on. But if you began to press like, well, necessary, how? Right. And then it was like, well, because don't you love him so much? Right. Or that kind of um, that kind of uh, mobilization. And, and that that wasn't something that really um, yeah, I did. Right. I was grateful, but I didn't really get how it all fit together. Um, and so anyway, yeah, my experience resonates with yours. And I had a more serious allegiance moment when I was in college, as I was involved in a, a variety of kind of sinful attractions that were dangerous to me and that I was harming myself through. Right. Um, and then I was uh, taking a New Testament course and that New Testament course that's when I had my kind of allegiance moment, I think, where I realized mm. like, wow, I, I, I have been not really taking the message of the New Testament seriously. I've read it a bit. I don't really under, didn't really understand it. Uh, but that's really where I kind of felt a real call to allegiance. And I had a, a maybe a second movement of grace in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, um, circling back to your baptism question, though, um, I think that's a great question. And for me, if I was going to be really precise about how baptism should function in the church, not how it normally functions, uh, because I, we have like a lot of different baptismal traditions. But I think mm-hmm. within a, a King Jesus and allegiance model, baptism should function as that which causes union with the king. It should mm-hmm. be the regenerative, mo- regenerative, regenerative moment. Um, and so I think that really whenever we look at ancient baptisms, that language of being baptized into the name of Jesus or into the name of the, or into the name of the Christ or into, there's a, there's a number of different, or into the Lord, right? We have a number of different formulations of that in the New Testament. What's the intention behind it? I think that we could, we could, by looking at some evidence, show that it involves a, a, an oil, a, an oath of loyalty, an oath of loyalty, so that a, a, a baptism should involve as part of the process 
you swearing your allegiance to King Jesus. Like you should, as part of your baptism, you should stand up and you should declare your faith. Uh, your fides, right, is what this was described as in the ancient world. And our first full description of a baptism in the earliest Christian tradition uh, comes from Tertullian in the early third century. And he describes this as part of the process. Like like you, there, there was an, a fides moment, right, where um, that was declared. So I think it's interesting um, as we look at our earliest context that they did in, th this did involve an oath. And so I would see that oath as being then what uh, what we mean by faith primarily in the New Testament is this uh, this act of loyalty towards Jesus that is saving faith. And it is specifically that then which causes us to enter into union with the, with the Christ and to receive his Holy Spirit. Well, to me, you're equipped to answer that question because you straddle two worlds. You work in a Catholic setting, but you still remain uh, a Protestant. And I think in some ways it's kind of to me, without getting all technical and losing the audience, ordinance versus sacrament. And I think that, and this is where I think trauma kind of comes in. I think that there was a rupture, obviously, um, with the Reformation that just basically kind of went ordinance. And 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 I do think there's some truth in sacrament, sacrament. But I think that, uh, and what I mean by that is that, in what ways are we, what ways are we participating in something that has heavenly and earthly implications at the same time? <laughs> And, and so for me, I, I think baptism is one of those things that has heavenly and earthly sacramental sort of it to me, ordinance is kind of symbolic. Um, and, and I, I guess it's, I don't know, maybe we should, you know, maybe explore that a little bit later, but just that idea that I think baptism does have, um, I think it does have a place in that allegiance process. Like my wife was in the air force and when she got, uh, when she, when she got in, she swore herself in, you know? Mm. Um, and, and the reason why I say this is because for, for some people, uh, I don't know, baptism at some point though, has been taken and, and been put in this, um, uh, it's been overdone. It's been overemphasized. And I think mm. that's part of what, why I'm going deep in this is because for some people, um, I just wanted to get someone who could explain it. Um, but for some people it becomes a, a focal point. In a, in a not sure. good way, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit more. Um, yeah. We see it, for example, in the New Testament examples where, you know, apart from baptism, there is there is spirit regeneration, mm -hmm. you know, on the basis of faith. We see this, for instance, the most famous example with, would be with Cornelius, right, and mm -hmm. his guests in Acts chapter, you know, 11. Um, yeah. And anyway, the spirit is poured out um, and it's further described by Peter in Acts 15. He explains what happened. He said that it was on the basis of, of their faith, right, that the Holy Spirit was poured out, not on the basis of baptism. Right. And so we see that God can work outside of baptismal channels. But on the other hand, I think we would want to say the ordinary circumstance in the earliest church was that that baptism was when you swore your oath and when you then received the Holy Spirit. So on the one hand, you're right, I think it can be overemphasized if we see baptism as the exclusive way in which God can work. We see God can work outside of baptism. For instance, we have no, we have no evidence that the apostles, like Peter, we have no evidence he was ever baptized as a Christian. He might have received John's baptism, but we have no evidence he was ever baptized as a Christian, nor any of the other apostles. Right? They, they're mm. baptized by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So it's not the physical act of baptism um, that moves them into the Christian community. right? Like It's on the basis of their repentance, which cleanses the heart, right? that they then are, are invited in and they have spirit regeneration. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we can overemphasize baptism, but we can also underemphasize it as it's the normal way, right? Um, and I think it's normal in the sense that especially if it's the moment we swear our allegiance to the king. All right, that's when Holy Spirit union happens. Thank you for that. It's, I, I really appreciate you kind of expounding on that. How do you believe deconstruction um, has affected our understanding of the gospel, both positively and negatively? Wow, that's a huge question and a great, uh, <laughs> great, a great shift in topic for us. Um, deconstruction is a huge issue right now, as it's a lot of people talking about deconstruction in the church. On the one hand, I think let me speak to it positively. Obviously, there are people who have been trapped in false systems, right, where um, the the guardians of truth have, um, oftentimes through no fault of their own, right, have uh, been teaching something that's slightly distorted. 
Um, and they, um, they're they locked into that, and they're refusing to look outside that paradigm, refusing to be corrected by Scripture even. Um, and sometimes harm comes through that, right? And that we mm-hmm. need to have moments where we are questioning, reassessing, reappraising, like looking for other authoritative voices, looking back to Scripture, um, staying in Holy Spirit community, right? Mm-hmm. And that all of those things are really critical um, for our uh, salvation and for um, staying in the church family. So mm-hmm. on the one hand, I would affirm that, you know, a deconstruction can have a positive uh, value for people and it, it can be a very necessary deepening process that really helps them. Um, I can speak to the negative too. Um, and I think what would concern me most about deconstruction would be two, uh, let me, let me grab two ideas there that would concern me most. Uh, number one would be whenever we do it outside the bounds of any kind of community, when we're like, okay, well, the community I'm part of, I just don't trust anymore. I feel like that there's too many people there who are led astray and that within our, we're like, we're going to go solo, (laughs) right? We're like, I just need some, I need some space to be me. I need to figure out my own journey. I need it. I need this to be my own narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, if we don't have a King Jesus narrative and King Jesus has a body, then I think we become dangerously detached. If we wow. think that there's some kind of neutral ground we can walk on where we're like, well, I don't know what the truth is over there. So I'm just going to be in this neutral space. We hmm. deceive ourselves in a very serious way. Wow. Um, that's very dangerous for us because um, uh, we're going to invariably decide, begin deciding what's right and wrong for ourselves. Right. And we're going to turn this into a self-centered story. that is no longer the King Jesus story. That freaks me out. Uh, when people mm. begin to go that route, it deeply freaks me out. The other thing that would be part of that would be when people just dispense with scriptural authority, where they are, um, they become like maybe more aware of complex hermeneutical and interpretive questions, and they're they're like, well, even the experts disagree about scripture. Um, you know, you have your interpretation, they have their interpretation, I have my interpretation. Who can know who's right? And they kind of throw up their hands. Um, that's that's also a naive kind of way of approaching the problem. And the reality is, is that I think we can, by keeping rooted in the, uh, the, the church community, right, um, we can spiral toward the truth together um, as we continue to have Scripture as our authority. It doesn't mean that scriptural interpretation isn't a complex art and science. It absolutely is, right? But the right answer is to stay under Scripture's authority mm-hmm. and to not just be like, well, who knows what it even means, so therefore I get to create my own story once again. Um, you notice I'm really worried about this idea that we get to be king of yeah. our own life, yep. right? that I get to be my own king really is what uh, very, very deeply concerns me about some forms of deconstruction, right? It ends up with a, a I'm the king of my own life result, and that is just damaging. Well, our, our beliefs are certainly world building. And when I think of, uh, you know, the streams that I'm a part of in terms of the restoration called a primitivism, right? Let's just, let's take the book of Acts. Let's get simple again. Let's throw out denomination and traditions and let's just obey King Jesus. And in the stream that I come from, the book of Acts is sort of the reference manual for how to create a pattern to do that. And so, we, you know, it can be standardized in different ways. The reason why I bring this up is because there is, I'm trying to engage healthy deconstruction. So for example, I've got a biblical literacy team and these are folks who, uh, uh, much more studied and have the time to study, like, let's say something like evangelism than I do. And so what we're doing is we're taking Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which is a real statement scripture, I think in, in the stream that I come from. Um, but we're also taking all the new Testament examples of evangelism and just kind of creating a basic framework. But in terms of just taking apart, sharing the good news, um, there. You know, in certain folks' life, there's been a lot of damage done in that area. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the damage that can happen is, um, you know, through a transactional understanding of the gospel that like, Mm. okay, what I, you know, I have this deficit and Jesus supplies my lack, his righteousness gets slapped onto me um, so that I'm righteous in God's eyes or something along those lines. And that transaction is all that matters. That's dehumanizing. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't really deal with the uniqueness of who Matt Bates is, who Kyle is, right? right. And um, we're, we're all uniquely gifted by God in our, in, in our diversity and in what we can bring in all of these ways. Um, and if instead God's main activity is the process of restoration, right? If he wants to take uniquely who you are, and he wants to, to take the rot and the filth that have crept into your life, and he wants to, to purify that and to restore you and to enhance you, to make you the best person you could possibly be. How humanizing is that, right? Wow. How beautiful, right? <laughs> um, and if instead it's all about like just slapping a forgiven sticker, you know, on somebody, well, that's part of the reason people like have reacted negatively and been harmed by faulty gospel messages is because that is dehumanizing. That is traumatizing to think God doesn't care about who you are. All he cares is whether or not the blood's been applied to you, right? Um, that is that is a dangerous lie because it misses the rest, restorative aims that God's not just saving us from something, but for something, right? And we got to get wow. the four part in there. Wow. Wow, that was that was <laughs> that was profound. Not just from, but for. Oh, wow. I mean that that to me that says a lot. That means that God is for us. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that that feels a little different from the God who just like some of us uh you know, we can just feel this mandate and this pressure to go and share the good news and it's on us if everyone doesn't get saved. It's on us if that person in the checkout line um we don't share with them and they're going to hell. And so there's this pressure and this burden of especially remnant oriented legacies that you're, you're it, you're the channel, mm -hmm. you're the door. People have to walk through your organization. They have to work through you work, walk through your denomination in order to be in the kingdom, the kingdom. And so I, I, what would you say to those who, cause I, what you just said really felt unburdening. <laughs> mm -hmm. What would you say to people, give people a context who feel a tremendous pressure, an unhealthy tre tremendous pressure when it comes to sharing the good news. I think there is a burden. I think there is a healthy burden, but I also think there's an unhealthy burden, if that makes sense. Can you speak to the unhealthy burden that many evangelicals or Protestants feel to go out and share? Yeah, well, I think you're right in saying there is a, a healthy burden, right? It is our delight and um, and and both our obedient obligation, right, to yes. uh, follow King Jesus and in, in sharing about Him. But yeah, if we if we um, if it has become something that is more about like I guess I guess we'd want to say quantity over quality, yes. Right? Then um, then I think that's part of the trauma, right? And part mm. of the um, the burden is that like we just need to get more and more people saved, yes. And that there's a sort of this numeric growth, this like it doesn't matter as long as we get another soul in, right? Um, again, that's dehumanizing, um, and it doesn't speak to the quality of life that people um, are finding in Jesus, and so. I think our best sharing about the gospel comes out of a sense that it comes whenever we see that there's something beautiful that has been corrupted or something mm. good that is in some way been defaced, something honorable that's become shameful. And that you can see that this thing could be honorable. It could be good. It could be beautiful. But in some way, it's gotten gross or become tarnished. Whenever mm. we see those things and we, and we, and we have hope, God could restore that. And, and I'm not just talking about people. I mean, on the one hand, that's the, there are all the broken people, right? But I'm talking about like the brokenness that is part of systems too, right? Mm. Like the, the, the hood, right? All the garbage going on with drug deals and prostitution and, and the whole neighborhood just needs Jesus, right? Wow. Um, whenever we begin to see that God has a vision for restoring all of creation, Right. And and that we get to be part of this and that it comes through King Jesus and it comes through a process of gazing on him and discipleship. I think that helps us to begin to see that it's not just about a burden to share. It's about like a vision for how good everything could be if people would begin to live in light of his servant kingship. If people would begin to take up their cross and follow like how transformative that would be. And I think that our sharing needs to kind of move into that orb, right? Where we see a vision of beauty. And I think that takes away a lot of our burden because we are mm. caught up in the vision too, 
right? Like we, we begin to not feel like guilt over, oh, like I should, I should share the message so that this, this soul can like not go to hell and experience like re restoration with God. Mm -hmm. But I don't even care about the restoration. I just care about a number, right? Mm -hmm. To instead being like, no, it's about like how this person could be caught up and swept up in this, this process that is like for all creation and how something beautiful and good could emerge for this person and for the created order through this restoration, that's when we're beginning to get motivated to share. Okay, you just said something that I, I think we need to kind of, we need to kind of go there. Um, and you had mentioned the hood and it needs transformation. It's very, very obvious. Like I live in, like Omaha is a very segregated place. I live in North Omaha, which is, mm -hmm. would be considered the hood. West Omaha would be, essentially Caucasian, pretty much everywhere else except for North and South. South would be um, Latino, Hispanic. Anyway, um, we live in what would be called the hood. And I think that, um, I think it's important that you brought that up because the way I've started to understand evangelism, and this is why I'm so glad to have a scholar on, because you can coach me, <laughs> um, is I believe that evangelism is about God's vision for wholeness, fundamentally, okay? So in my mind, evangelism is becoming, and I, I pray that this is the Holy Spirit giving me this, but evangelism is becoming about looking at a situation that is unwhole and diseased in every systemic, like in every layer of system in our society. In other words, not just the hood, we can see that to your point, we're like, we have a halfway house in the end of the street. We've got other stuff going on. I don't want to get into publicly, <laughs> but God has a vision for wholeness, not just this individual sort of ins fire insurance, right? And so, and this goes to our next question in terms of being transformative, but God's vision for wholeness also applies to what we see when it comes to politics. God's vision for wholeness also applies to what we see in terms of the racial tension that exists in our churches. Sundays are still the most segregated day of the week. God has a vision for wholeness, mm. right? He has a vision for total restoration. And so I, I think to some degree, I just would like for you to speak to his vision for, I mean, obviously he has a vision for the hood, um, but also has a vision for other environments that have become politicized or radically committed to, let's say, Christian nationalism. Mm. That's not that's not the gospel. Christian nationalism, mm. Matt, is not the gospel. So I just I want to go there for a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking more broadly, I guess from my own experience, um, I, whenever I was in graduate school in South Bend, uh, we lived in the near Northwest neighborhood, which was the hood. Um, and yeah. <laughs> one of the beautiful things that, I mean, this wasn't my idea, like, um, you know, in any way, but one of the beautiful things that was going on there was there was an organization that was a nonprofit group called the Near Northwest Neighborhood, and they were mm -hmm. buying abandoned homes and they were revitalizing them using grant money. And um, they were able to attract in uh, people who were, you know, uh, Christians, non-Christians, a variety of people who were probably of a little more uh, social mobility, a little, little higher education level, um, whatever it might be, and, and kind of mixing into these neighborhoods. And uh, it was really astonishing the way in which that was transformative for me, right, as somebody who, you know, was probably on the more, you know, well-educated, socially mobile end of things, but also for mm. uh, people who were part of that and just the whole like mixture was really a beautiful thing. So when I think about um, transformation, like that's something that comes to my mind, like that beautiful thing that was happening there in South Bend. I hope it's still happening. I haven't really kept my feet on the ground, uh, but um, it was our, it was an experience. I and mean, we had drive by shootings while we were in the neighborhood. People were hit wow. the ground. You know, I mean, this wasn't an everyday occurrence, but it did happen. Um, and uh, wow. prostitution happening, and you know, and at the same time, uh, Notre Dame graduate students living all over the neighborhood. At, no, all over the neighborhood as well. But really quite, kind of astonishing. Uh, anyway, uh, how does this actually hit the ground in terms of politics? Um, boy, that's a big question. And I don't think I have the expertise to really answer it. What I can say is this, is that I think that we're deceived when we think that the real political action is happening somewhere other than the local church. When, mm. when, we, when we as Christians become convinced that like, like, okay, like this Jesus is king business, that's cute. 
Um, but let me tell you about where real political power happens, Matt and Kyle. Real political power happens with the presidency and the Senate and at the national level and at the international oh. level. That's all the real political business. Like you guys are playing games with your cute ideas about Jesus. Um, I think that's that we're deceived whenever we buy into that. Uh, that whenever we come together as a church, whenever we actually become the church, now sometimes we meet and we don't, we're not the church, but when we come together and we become the church, we do so because we're proclaiming Jesus is king. I would say that's actually what constitutes the church. If we come together and we're just like singing some songs and we're not, we're not actually like submitting to his authority, if we're actually together saying, you actually are my king right now, I submit to your authority right now, that's when I think the Holy Spirit is active in a way that Jesus can actually begin to rule. That's when a body politic emerges. That's whenever we actually become an alternative alternative political and social body in the midst of the world. And I think real political power actually moves forth from there, but it is Jesus kind of power that is cross-shaped, that is not easily discerned. It doesn't look very glorious, right? Because we are all these broken vessels, right? And it's only as the glory of God begins to shine through our weakness right? That we begin to see that there is a real political power here, but we are Mm -hmm. deceived as the church whenever we think that, no, the real political power is on the left or on the right or on grabbing power between the two of them. Uh, No, real political power happens when the church is the church. That's Mm -hmm. what I think is, I think that's the truth. I think, I, I think you, I needed you to say that because I like how you talked about how the, if Jesus is King, the Holy Spirit is working in a way. And we see that number one, the Holy Spirit understands kingdom better than we do. That's number one. And number two, whenever people truly come together, we know it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only person who can truly bring unity. Mm -hmm. And so I like that you just mentioned those two things. And in chapter five, moving on here, uh, you write about royal transformation. Um, let me, let me, let me say why I think this is so important. Um, some streams who feel called to restore Christianity, um, good hearted, very good hearted, wanted to convert the world. Let's just say, um, they've come up, you know, with different evangelism proclamations and so forth. And so there is this idea of how you change the world is to make it Christian. What I've noticed, Matt, is that there's a difference between growth and transformation. Sometimes, like you were saying earlier about focusing on numerical growth, I think that you can miss transformation if you're not careful. Um, I think of early century Christianity. It, what did it take three or 400 years and then quote unquote, the world started becoming Christian? Um, you had the numbers, but did you have transformation? <laughs> right? And so uh, transformation... I think it's probably becoming my biggest question for people. I love that you also talked about the 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 macro, but also more the micro or the, the global, but then the local. Locally, are people experiencing transformation? And what I find is when I ask that question, are people transforming? Consistently, people are saying that their local church is not a place where they're they're experiencing transformation. So in chapter five, royal trans, I like that you put royal transformation. I love this. Okay. How might this idea of royal transformation benefit those who are hungering for a deeper understanding of discipleship? Yeah, so with this topic of royal transformation, what I have in view especially is uh, it's kind of framed around a glory cycle um, that I discuss beginning in chapter three and that carries on through chapter four and chapter five. And uh, in order to understand, I guess, how, what royal transformation means and how it fits in, let me speak quickly to the glory cycle. So the okay. idea is that God is glorious, right? That he is the, the one who uh, holds the glory objectively because of the virtue of who he is and his name, mm-hmm. his very essence. Right? But that he then gifts humanity with that glory devolves onto humanity as part of our image bearing capacity. But then mm-hmm. we reject that. Like we then reject um king jesus's rule we reject god's rule over us and we throw the glory to the ground Um, but then god sends king jesus who is the glorious one and when we think about the incarnation uh, that's what we have in view is the incarnation is when jesus 
uh, takes on human flesh, right? And whenever we have that key statement about incarnation, we discover that the purpose behind it, right, is so that we could see the glory, right? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And what? And we have seen his glory, the glory of the mm. one and only. Um, so we we then we then have an opportunity to view Jesus. That's the key idea that I wanted to get to. Um, as he comes then in his capacity as the fully human one who shows us what it's like to be God. And that's why we call this royal transformation is because he's the king. And that our transformation, then how do we get back? How do we how do we have our glory restored? Hmm. Um, we actually have our glory restored by gazing on King Jesus. It's it's by gazing on him that the process of transformation begins to ensue. So we have to come and see. That's how I, I describe the situation in uh, in chapter five, right? We have to approach Jesus with an attitude of intentional discipleship that we have to like, just like his first disciples did, they came, right? They approached him and they, and they came in order to see what he was all about. Um, and in so doing transformation begins to ensue because we have the opportunity to then be, become like the fulfilled human, right? The, the very one who is the son of man, who is the paradigm for what it means to be fully human. Oh, I love that. Uh, literally, my my thesis work is going to be biblical humanity. <laughs> I can't. I love yeah, that. How, every, every time you talk about being human, oh, image bearing, vocation, like image bearing is a vocation. Like it's mm. like you got to learn what. Anyway, you just keep you keep saying all these things that I just I just want to bite off and have a more, <laughs> a full interview on. Um, Good, good. Well, yeah, there's lots of great work being done on this, right? I'm drawing, obviously, from other scholars who have done work on image and on image bearing, like Carmen Imes, like would come to mind as a okay. very recent scholar who's who's doing work in this direction. Uh, but yeah, lots of, um, yeah, Greg Beal has done some excellent work on, on like we become like what we worship and how that connects mm. to image. John Walton uh, and some of his stuff on the Old Testament. Lots and lots of people who have done great work here that um, that I'm drawing from. This idea of transformation is uh, very important because um, what it feels like, going back to your comment about from versus for, is when our primary identity is that is that of a sinner and we become the saved sinner, we kind of, I mean, Jesus makes it very clear that we, we kind of go from being a servant or a slave to becoming a friend. Hmm. Um, that he isn't just someone who rescues us and he has many ways that we reference him. He's a brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and so this idea of transformation to me feels very relational. And the reason why I say that is because it's one thing, Matt, to 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 talk this stuff, but on a local day in and day out communal level, you know, how are we gonna help people to walk this out? And the only way I know, honestly, the only way I know to do that is through relationship. You know, relationship is a contact sport. And so transformation in your mind, what are some things that are involved as it relates to, let's say one another, like there's a lot of one another scriptures in the new Testament. Mm. Um, when it comes to the use of the Holy spirit, I think the Holy spirit is under taught. Mm. So in terms of the Holy spirit, in terms of being each other's lives and one another, how do those affect transformation? Yeah. Um, so, of course, yeah, being part of the corporate body is really critical, right? We realize that one member of the body doesn't do all the tasks, right? We mm -hmm. do need the hand and the foot and uh, and so on and so forth, and so that we learn from one another. So I think that well, one thing to kind of keep in mind would be that, like, there's a kind of a mutual glory refreshment that goes on. Like, if you're pursuing King Jesus so that you are coming to look more like him and I'm mm -hmm. seeing you, well, you're bearing the image correctly increasingly bearing it correctly. And that actually recharges me and my glory refreshment. So like we're gazing on King Jesus, but we're also seeing one another, right? As fellow mm. image bearers. And so like, it's gotta be a communal process. The idea is, is as each member of the community moves up a little bit, right? In terms of transformation, well, we're all seeing each other as we do that, right? As that's how God designed it. Um, and so it has to be a communal process of glory refreshment. Yeah, and so the spirit is deeply involved in all that and bearing forth the fruit, right? that would um, be the evidence and be the visible um, effects of this sort of transformative process that's going on. So in uh, in chapter five, I talk a lot about how Jesus embodies his own principles, that, mm. um, that he serves as a living law, that it's not like the king comes and is just a paradigm for what humanity should be. He is the paradigm partly by giving us wise principles that he himself lives out and then inculcates. 
right? And so that he teaches us to, you know, love our enemies, but then he doesn't, right? We see him, uh, you know, on the cross, um, you know, Father, forgive them, right? And we, uh, we, we see this kind of ethic that Jesus gives us. On the one hand, he tells us what to do, but on the other hand, we see him actually living out his own principles and in so doing, becoming the living law, which is really what it means to be an ideal king. Um, so he himself then, through his example, um, he inculcates the values into his people so that we then can be transformed. The next question, the last question is in chapter six, good news for the nuns. And on page 41, you mentioned quality over quantity. Uh, and you mentioned several things. I wish I, I had time to read it, but, um, I like that you write to the nuns and here's what I've started to do, Matt, in many of my interviews, like the last question pretty much is going to be next generation oriented. You and I are not the future. We're not. And I'm starting oh, on, we're to, not, we're not that old. We're not that weird. Old <laughs> we're not that old. <laughs> and you and I both know our kids are the future. They are. And That's so, and I know you know that, um, but we're not the future. Yeah. And I think that when it comes to the gospel, our frame absolutely has to include the next generation. It has to every single time. Um, when I think about the Shema, uh, the Shema is this collective, but it's really um, about our home being devoted to God in many ways. I think that devotion to God starts in the home and uh, kingdom starts in the home, in my mind. Um, and so the nuns, uh, I don't know what the quality of their experience has been. I'd have to look at the research. Barna has done some really good research on what's mm -hmm. going on with the nuns. I'm actually going to be, I'm in yeah. the process of interviewing David Kinnaman, hopefully. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I, well, I draw on his work extensively for oh, what you do. I say. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, he's my main source in speaking about some of the issues the nuns have. Yeah, get him on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about this. Is Why, why do you think this quality over quantity is something that's important to that group? Well, yeah, so some of the issues that are, you know, according to the Barna studies, which are professional, re, you know, professional research studies that they've done, like they, they actually say there are six reasons why people who are in the nun category um, opt to remain in the nun category. Like they're not interested in becoming Christians. And um, uh, there's, there's six reasons, as Barna has studied it out, that seem to be the primary reasons. Some of the top reasons are ones that probably aren't going to surprise us on the one hand. Uh, but on the other hand, are maybe issues that we can address through a more holistic gospel. For instance, um, number one seems to be hypocrisy, um, that Christians don't live out what they say they believe, and uh, people are turned off by this. How can a more holistic gospel um, help us to attract people then who are in this category of being nuns and who have been turned off by hypocrisy? Um, well, one thing that you might notice would be that a model that is about trusting a Savior involves a limited number of mental acts, right? Hmm. On the one hand, uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, become intellectually persuaded that Jesus is the Savior. Uh, we need then to um, acknowledge that personally, like I personally then um, uh, acknowledge that that is true for me, right? And I'm trusting on that for myself. But notice that doesn't involve your body in any kind of way, right? That's a, that's a, a, a mental construct that you've put in place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you think more about what does it mean not to respond to a savior, but to give loyalty to a king, and that the way in which I come into a right relationship with this king is ordinarily through a baptismal oath where I place my body uh, underneath Jesus's kingship and where I swear that I'm going to try to be loyal to him uh, with my body, my mind, my soul, all that I am, there's a much more holistic dimension. There's no part of your mind or your body that gets left over, right? Whenever you're, whenever you're entering into salvation on the basis of your commitment to be loyal to King Jesus, that looks quite a bit different right? Then whenever you are just mentally trusting the Savior so that, oh yeah, maybe I'll do some good works too, and I need to because that's the fruit. That's a very different way of thinking about it. So I think hypocrisy is a number one reason um, that people turn away. Uh, but as you mentioned, another reason has to do with this idea of, of especially of, of quality, um, and uh, that, that they're turned away, like the nuns are turned away, because there's a sense that all Christians want to do is get another convert. Um, that's mm. a big turnoff to them. It's like they've encountered people who have like maybe pretended to be their friend or like have like engaged in some sort of um, fellowship with them. Uh, and they thought, hey, like I have a new friend. And then, and then they present the gospel to them 
And then uh, the person says, I'm not really interested in this gospel business. And then the Christian's like, mm, see ya. I'm, you know, shaking some dust off my feet. I'm out of here. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's damaging uh, because uh, it's uh, damaging in, all, in, in a gazillion ways, right? But it's damaging, um, especially because it communicates that all that Jesus is interested in and all that God is interested in is that whether or not you make this decision, right? And that he's not interested in the quality of person you're becoming. He just wants you to get you know, enrolled somehow in the heavenly roster. Um, and uh, But that doesn't resonate or jive well with who we know we are, right? That we are right. all these unique people and that we actually need unique restoration. Um, so mm. I do think that um, a lot of the, one of the main reasons uh, people who are in the nun category have turned away is that sense that um, that I my quality of person does not really matter to Christians, and they only want to be my friend because they want to evangelize me, and that's da that's damaging. Wow, you hit the you summed that up in a way that I just that that struck me in my core because it 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 to me. We're being witnessed. When I when I think of emotional healing from trauma, one of the key terms or concepts is this idea of witnessing, right? I had a trauma-informed evangelism by uh, interview uh, by uh, Kaiser and Heath. They wrote a book called Trauma-Informed Ev Evangelism. One of the things they talked about in the in their book is how many people come to the table when it comes to Christianity and they have bad, damaging, traumatizing experiences. And so in, in the Holy Spirit is a witness, an advocate, but a witness in, in our, as image bearers, our role is to be an empathetic witness. I think that when I, when I think of Christians, we kind of in our almost maybe in some ways think it's our birthright to come out and slam people in the face with the gospel. And that's why I'm having you on because it is kingship, but we're talking about a different type of king. Mm. Um, and, and so I think for a lot of people, to your point, they do feel the pressure to just slam the truth in people's faith, uh, face, so to speak. Um, but that doesn't allow space to be an empathetic witness. And what I'm hearing you say is that you're not taping, taking empathy out of kingship. Um, I think of Hebrews, you know, uh, Hebrews, uh, I think it was Hebrews five. It talks about that. Um, every high priest is aware of his own weakness and also the weaknesses of those he serves. And so Jesus is that high priest. He is this empathetic. He he's tested in every way that we are, were, but found without sin. And so in this gospel allegiance, I'm hearing though, in that there is room for empathy. Is that, is that part of where you're coming from? For sure. Yeah. And I think that there's room for holistic restoration, right? And that, I mean, one of the damaging things that we do as part of our evangelism is sometimes lead out, right? With the idea that like you're a sinner, that, you know, because of this, you're, you're in a, this wrong relationship with God and that what you really need then is the cross. Um, mm -hmm. True as some of that might be, right? Yeah. Um, that it's not a helpful way of leading out. Uh, people are usually aware that they're sinners in some way, right? Um, they're not necessarily convinced whether or not Jesus is the solution, but right. what they need is a bigger vision, right? What they need to do is right. first see that Jesus might be the solution, and the way in which they should become aware of their own sinfulness. If you want to, if you want to convince somebody that they're a sinner in need of God's grace, what you need to do is you need to start telling them stories of your own brokenness and restoration. I say like this is a story of how I'm broken, and this is a story of how Jesus is beginning to restore or has restored, right? And that as we do that, right, then they, they, can, they can see themselves in a mirror, right? They, see, mm. they begin to see, oh, I'm broken too. I didn't even realize I was broken in all these ways. But, you know, hearing my friend talk about his brokenness and how God's bringing restoration, it begins to give me hope that, I, well, actually, I see my own brokenness better, and I'm beginning to catch a vision of the beauty that God intends, when we lead out with beauty, right, and we lead out with restoration, and we and we share stories of how our brokenness is being healed, um, yeah, there's a lot of empathy, right? Because there should be, right? We, but we are in the exact same position <laughs> yeah. of healing, right? In the exact same position of, of ongoing need for healing um, that somebody outside of Christ is. We have the advantage of, of being part of the Holy Spirit community, right, mm. and having the, our special share of that that they don't enjoy yeah. yet. Um, but nevertheless, like we are still needing to be healed just as they are on page 40, 141, I want to end with this. It says, but here's the key point. I love this. 
Ongoing allegiance is the transformational, transformative process through which God continues saving you. That to me feels like a savior who keeps saving me because I, I'm telling you right now, I've blown it. I can't tell you how many conversions it feels like I've gone through as a Christian. It's been around 20 years or so. And what I find is, is that he's every bit of the savior now and has to be that he's ever been. That doesn't go away. And, and it's interesting. I was an 18 year old kid and I swore my allegiance to him and he took me where I was and my prefrontal cortex wasn't even cortex wasn't even fully developed, but he took me. He said, I'll take it. You you don't even understand this and you don't even understand that. And it just amazes me how over time that you talked about that transformative effect. It takes years and years. I look at Peter and and he he's a mess. Like I love Peter because he he looks like a mess and I can identify with that. <laughs> And, and, but anyway, this idea of we serve a God who continues to save us. Something feels therapeutic, Matt, about that statement. And I just want to thank you for it. You're welcome. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for God's transformative work in my own life and it's an ongoing process, right? And for his work in yours, doubtless too. Absolutely. Well, I want to tell you what I tell all my guests that we are with you and God is for you, my brother, Matt. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kyle. Absolutely. Well, if you've been listening through this entire interview, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sticking around. Um, this has been one of those episodes that you probably have to go back and watch maybe a couple of times. And there are those of you who will watch it all the way through over and over and over and I want to thank you for your support. Please go and check me out on Patreon. That's what makes all of this possible. I raise support independently, and it allows me to have these interviews and have conversations that if I were in the full-time ministry or something like that, it might just be a little bit more challenging to have. So I want to thank those of you that are supporters, and I'll see you next time.